on this edition of In the Life. Crossing borders, crossing cultures, revealing the past. It's a strange dance. What we tell each other and what we don't. And the future. All up next on In the Life, America's information line on lesbian and gay issues and culture. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by William J. Resnick, Jeffrey B. Soroff, the Michael Palm Foundation, the New York Community Trust, and In the Life members nationwide. I'm Katherine Linton. For Black History Month, celebrated every February, In the Life takes the opportunity to look at the diversity and complexity of the gay and lesbian community. Now, the word community implies a shared or common experience, but while gay men and lesbians drawn together by sexual orientation face many of the same challenges, we are by no means a monolithic group. Varied backgrounds and beliefs, races and religions give this community many different faces. And more often than not, gay people identify with more than one community, crossing boundaries of culture, geography, sometimes even gender. On this program, you'll meet gay people who are tearing down barriers and crossing borders to find common ground. Places where history, heritage, and identity can intersect and integrate, or at least coexist. But we begin at the most frequently crossed border in the world, and a town known for tourism, trinkets, and frankly anything goes, Tijuana, Mexico. But perhaps lesser known is that Tijuana and its surrounding area has the second highest rate of AIDS in Mexico, surpassed only by Mexico City. But the gay and lesbian community here has been waging an uphill battle against the disease through advocacy, education, and direct services. A battle that can only be fully understood in light of Mexico's complex relationship with her powerful neighbor to the north. Many Americans come to Tijuana for sex, provided by men and women who sell their bodies, perhaps to feed a family or sometimes to feed a drug habit. So much of the AIDS that we have down here can be attributed to Americans coming from California into this region uh, and uh, engaging in sexual, you know, utilizing the services of the sex industry down here, which is a major industry in Tijuana. Fred Scholl works as the volunteer pharmacologist at ACOCIDA, or Alliance Against AIDS, an AIDS outpatient clinic in Tijuana run by gay activists. ACOCIDA was started in October 1989. For eight years, it has been the only HIV clinic in Tijuana. It has never closed. Currently, only 15% of Akusita clients are gay men. 40% of the clients are heterosexual couples. But a closer look at Mexican culture may explain this trend. A much higher percentage of men in Mexico have bisexual experiences than in the United States. And of course, that contributes to the AIDS situation because men can get infected with HIV and take it home to their wives. And that's a common scenario here. No matter how people get infected with the HIV virus, getting treatment for any Mexican citizen always depends on access to money. If the person has money, they can get treated in the United States. Or they can pay a private doctor who will charge a lot of money and may not help them as much, because doctors here are not up to par with the latest treatments. People without the financial means, the working class who go to the general hospital, are referred to government offices, and from there they send them here, to us. Acosita is the only clinic in Mexico that provides AIDS drugs to its patients free of charge, drugs that are brought here from San Diego and elsewhere in the United States. I essentially, through a network in San Diego and throughout a chunk of the United States, collect medicines and medical supplies that would normally be thrown away 
and bring them down here. Because of American laws, prescribed drugs that are no longer useful to a patient are usually thrown away. Let's say if I had AZT and I had a friend that needed AZT, and I gave that friend AZT in the U.S., I'd be committing a felony. Uh, if I donate it to a medical organization outside of the U.S., that's not violating the law. So what happens is this stuff is donated for use down here. Ironically, the supply of life-giving drugs to Akasita has depended on the death of Americans with AIDS. It might be morbid, but we depend on people dying for, for our medicines, or that their, their medicines are changed. And prior to the protease inhibitors, we were not only providing medicines to this clinic, but we were providing medicines to clinics in Mexicali and in Guadalajara and, and in Mexico City. Uh, we had lots of medicines, and then all of a sudden they dried up because people were living. And I've worked with AIDS long enough that we have kind of a, oh, we've developed a jaded attitude. We have seen every wonder cure. You know, AZT was it, and then there was DDI, and then there was this, and then there was 3TC. Every one of those things have come along, and the virus has a way of adjusting. So we, we said, if things go the way they always have, we might have about six months and people are going to start dying again. And you know what? That's happened. The studies have shown only about 50% of the people taking the protease inhibitors that it works with. The other 50% it doesn't. And so now we're getting a good supply again. With a budget of just $12,000 a year and an all-volunteer staff, the clinic can only see patients once a week and has endured many hardships. For a couple of years, we had no running water, and a lot of times we have had electrical problems. It really narrows down to a lot of priorities. You know, this is why we don't have a, a cell telephone. This is why we don't have a, the latest technology in computers. This is why we don't have a lot of, you know, modern facilities, because we have to sort of make a budget throughout the year and then sort of live by it. But volunteers at the clinic are fulfilled in other ways. It's important for me because there are lots of people that one day, I'm not sure it can happen to them, but tomorrow or the day after, it could happen to any of my kids or to me. This is important to me because I can help not only the institution, but the patients. While Akosita provides much-needed help to the HIV community in Tijuana, the majority of those infected by the virus remain untreated. People with HIV are susceptible to tuberculosis, a disease that has hit epidemic proportions in Tijuana and is infecting more and more people across the border in San Diego as well. You have a combination of AIDS and TB working together, which has a synergistic effect. And if you don't deal with it here, you're going to deal with it over there. And they already are starting. So it's, it's just infectious diseases don't respect borders. This philosophy drives the work of many Americans and Mexicans who cross the border to fight AIDS. This is really just one big metro area divided by a fence, a fence put up by the US government. And it's a fence that runs right down the middle of my life. And I don't, uh, I don't have any less human feelings for people who live on this side of the fence than who live on the San Diego side of the fence. And I wish that more people in San Diego felt the same way. As far as me going up to different cities, up, up in California and even Oregon, New York and, and in Canada, and talking about what we do down here and giving them the literature, that has been very, very successful, you know, and I think that once they, they hear our story, our struggle down here, I, I think uh, the people will be able to help us out with the medication because, it's, it, you know, for us, it's more important to have the medication than, than to have millions of dollars. On our last day in Tijuana, we traveled down a dirt road to visit Casa Ogar de San Rafael, the only AIDS hospice in the city run by Brother Armando Maya. The hospice is home to men and women who are in the final stages of AIDS and other terminal diseases. Here, he has gotten a great deal of help from Brother Armando, medicine, food. He has received all kinds of attention. The little bit that Armando has, he shares. That little car has many uses, but is very old and in bad condition. 
estar ya en malas condiciones. Tengo una persona con cáncer. I have a person with cancer, and we need to take her to the hospital. But she has to suffer because the car is too small, and she no longer has skin in her affected area. So it is very important to give us support with an ambulance. Besides an ambulance, the hospice needs other basic supplies, more food, more medicine, and more volunteers. We are only two people here, sometimes taking care of as many as 15 patients at a time, and we are not enough. With up to 15 patients at a time, perhaps the most pressing problem is the lack of running water. Now our priority is the payment of general services, such as the water installation, because this place doesn't have pipes yet. Y la introducción de la misma porque aún no no hay tubería en este lugar. But for this, we need money. I have seen a lot of miracles here, and I've seen a lot of people very, very sick, and I've seen them get up. We have extended their lives. We have given them hope, and I think the, the hope that we give them with the medication, with the support, with the attention that we give them. It, even going to their houses and sharing the little they have, it's something emotional that sort of gets to your heart. The Aquasita Clinic is an excellent example of how a grassroots community-based organization can do something when there's nothing happening at all. That's the only way that anybody in Tijuana with AIDS gets access to any antiretroviral drugs. Well, that's amazing. That's from no drugs to, uh, to some people getting state-of-the-art treatment. Some people are on three drug combos with protease inhibitors. That would be unthinkable without the Aquasita Clinic. It would be just a crazy dream. For singer-songwriter Joy Cardwell, negotiating two completely different worlds is something she does almost daily. An African-American, a Latina, and out lesbian, Cardwell is also a mother, tending by day to the often mundane demands of home and family. But by night, she's a glamorous performer whose jazz-infused songs have topped the music charts. We spent a day in the life of Joy Cardwell and discovered that a down-to-earth diva is not necessarily a contradiction in terms. Ramses, you gonna be a good boy and stop barking? Huh? Come on, Mike, let's go. Here we go. We're late again. You want help? I'm gay, no. Uh, that's been an open fact, I guess, since the beginning of my career. Hi, George. Hi, George. You know, realness is a, is a big part of my life, and I think that uh, young kids don't have enough role models. I am in a relationship of uh, almost three years. Our nephew, uh, his name is Michael. He's li he lives with us here, and uh, that's a real trip, becoming overnight mothers to a seven-year-old boy. Stop, stop, stop and I was born in the Bronx, literally born in the Bronx and scuttled to Queens where I was raised. Lived there most of my life. Uh, my first performance was at five years old at Carnegie Hall um, where I was in a dance recital. I always saw performing as something that everyone did. I started so young, it didn't seem like anything unnatural for me. I write all my own songs. It's all my voice, so I do the backgrounds myself as well. Sometimes I call other people and when I need a little weight to it. I guess the primary message that I always try to convey is one of hope. Um, 
one of oneness with all people, universal themes about love and uh, disappointments and uh, empowerment. Things that as a woman in particular and as a woman of color and, you know, colorfulness, um, I, I try to make sure that my messages are always positive. I think growing up in the city has made me more open to, to almost anything, to, uh, to other cultures, to other experiences. And I think the energy of, of the city definitely has played a part, perhaps more so in the past than it does now. I find um, serenity to be a little more uh, appropriate for creating. The other side of, of my uh, sanity is my partner. Lori is the, the partner in a true sense. When I can't do something, she is the person that is helping me. I think having that, a relationship that is actually a true partnership, is the only way that, that anybody who has so many responsibilities can um, get through them. Hey, man. How was your day today? Good. Having Michael here is an exercise in patience. Did you have science today? No. So it's another way of, I guess, humbling myself by, you know, living my life for a child because that yeah. is our main focus right now. The music is, is you know, something I do and I'm in and out of town and stuff like that. But family is very important. So who who wears the small shoes? The ballerina. Mm -hmm. Which one? Which word is ballerina? This one. This one. This one or this one? Ballerina. We moved here to be closer to my family, particularly my mom who passed away this year. I had a good life with her and I have a lot of great memories. She's the one that gave me my first tape recorder and my first stereo and told me not to mess up her records, you know, gave me a respect for music. I never thought of that I would be this this dance diva or whatever that I've been called. The persona is a person that only exists for a couple of minutes when the lights and cameras and, and the, the stage is there. Um, that to me is almost not a real life. I'd like to thank God to you for this outfit, although they didn't know it was intended for me. Once I get up on stage, I step out of my average hat and hang it up on the hook and become something larger than that because that's what it's all about, the fantasy of, of being bigger than life. When you're striving to be a superstar and a super mom, most of your attention, understandably, is on the here and now. But as correspondent Tanya Barfield tells us, some lesbians and gay men have turned their attention to the past, exploring connections to their cultural and religious heritage. From a current play about supernatural possession to homoerotic undertones in old Yiddish films, gay and lesbian artists are finding connections to aspects of Jewish culture. In music, on stage, and on screen, they're exploring the parallels between two seemingly different experiences. Jews in early 20th century Europe, and gay men and lesbians in this country today. And they're finding places where the old and new worlds intersect.
I noticed there were several films which I had seen different segments of that seemed to me to have lesbian and gay subtext, and it took quite a long time until I really could study them in depth. But the more I looked, the more I found. Eve Sikular lectures on gay and lesbian subtext in Yiddish films. Jewish Luck was a Soviet Yiddish silent film. And actually, it does not, in my point of view, have a lesbian or gay subtext. What it does have is a great visual moment where these two matchmakers come together and they're, they're, they've got a couple that should meet. And it turns out that someone made a mistake and instead of a bride and groom, they're introducing two brides. And so these two women in veils and gowns burst forth at the same moment from literally these closet doors. In Yiddish films, generally, there's a real element of modesty. There's very little that's going to be openly sexual erotic at all. Jewish life was very segregated by sex. It's much like Spartan life, if you'll forgive the simile. But, uh, and so men spend a lot of time together, most of their days studying in the synagogue together. Both Joachim Nugroschel and Eve Sikular agree that some of the most homoerotic imagery is in the 1937 movie version of the Yiddish play, The Dibbit. In regard to a gay subtext, in the Dybbuk or in, in the movie version. I don't think there is one in the original play. The movie, however, which goes back in time and really starts with the two fathers as friends making a vow to have their children marry one another, has a very strong gay subtext, I think. We see the two fathers celebrating their friendship by singing the Song of Songs, but the Song of Songs is considered so erotic that it's never taught in, in, uh, in, 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 in Jewish uh, grade schools. And if you have two men, two friends, two adolescents or young men in their 20s sing a song of songs together, the implication is clear. Uh, you, you have to infer that there is some kind of erotic bond between them. An adaptation of the original play, The Dybbuk, was recently mounted at the Public Theater in New York. I really regard my version of The Dybbuk as much a gay play as Angels in America. Um, I don't think that it needs to be specifically um, filled with homosexual characters or even have any. While nothing in Kushner's adaptation of the Dybbuk is overtly gay, a broken promise between men is the single catalyst for the supernatural chaos that follows. I think that the play in a certain sense is caused by a broken promise and by failure of love. Um, and interestingly enough, it's a failure of love, of a bond of love made between two men. And I think that's what really catalyzes everything in the play. It's not so specifically that anybody's forbidden. And I am flame, and wherever she is, I will be rekindled. Adubik tells the story of a woman whose body is invaded by her dead lover's spirit on the eve of her arranged marriage to someone else. Congratulate me! to sign the contract for my daughter's marriage. Um, and it's a play that's sort of, in a certain sense, a kind of a metaphysical drag act. I mean, there's a, a lead character, which is what gives the play its great transgressive force. And it was shocking to audiences at, you know, in the 1920s. And it's still sort of shocking is that it's a, you know, a young woman um, whose body um, has been taken over and has invited in the spirit of a, of a dead man. I mean, I think the moment that moves me the most is really a heterosexual moment in one sense, although it's universal in another, when, when Conan's ghost, the boy's ghost, appears at the end to Leia, when she asks him, who are you? He says, I've forgotten. And then he says, I can only remember if you remember me. And I mean, that's so incredibly powerful um, because it speaks to the absolute primal um, centrality and importance of love, that, that we don't have an identity singularly, and that we rely on those who love us to tell us who we are. A moving aspect of a Dybbuk is the haunting, abstract, Eastern European flavored music composed and performed by the well-known band, The Klezmatics. How can I describe the Klezmatics? We are a radical Jewish roots music band. And what we do is we take traditional East European Jewish klezmer music, which is Jewish party music, dance music, and we put a kind of contemporary spin on it. And that's what the Klezmatics do.
members of the Klezmatics, including Alicia Spiegel, are gay. I think that our sexuality always comes up in the Klezmatics, and there are several reasons for this. One is that we believe in playing and creating Jewish roots music that's authentic. And by authentic, I don't mean copying an old 78 from 1917, like many groups do. It's, uh, we don't like to do historical reconstruction. We think about authentic like our shrinks think about authentic, like being true to ourselves. And that means leaving in our politics, leaving in our sexuality, leaving in all our other musical influences, which is why we've got the sounds of rock, of jazz, and everything else in there. As gay people, we, we grow up learning to love being marginal, for one thing. And Yiddish culture is really on the margins of Jewish mainstream culture and society. So if you're already somebody who enjoys being gay, enjoys being different, enjoys having a position halfway on the outside and halfway on the inside, then the Yiddish culture scene is the place to be. Issues surrounding identity also inspired New York-based filmmaker Mackie Alston to examine his own heritage. At the age of 27, Alston discovered that he had descended from one of the largest slave-owning families in North Carolina. When he was a child, he met African-American children with his same last name. At the time, he didn't ask any questions. But as an adult gay man who knew the cost of keeping secrets and the value of being open and honest, Alston decided to confront his family's history. In his debut documentary film entitled Family Name, Mackie Alston travels back to North Carolina and speaks with both black and white Alstons about their common name. One thing to go and hope to have conversations with African-American Alstons whose ancestors your ancestors owned. Um, it's great to have great intentions in wanting to do so, but it's a really, really hard thing to do. So I went from record to record to record, uh, birth certificate, death certificate. I got obsessed because I wanted to have this conversation with an African-American Austin, and I wanted to have that conversation with somebody who I knew was related to me historically, and then I wanted to find somebody who I knew was related to me by blood. But that's the kind of history that generations of people have been trying to erase. I think this is for the birds. You don't know, like it. Now, the biggest story is with my grandmother, because I had not come out to my grandmother, and I say that in the film. And it's an interesting scene in the film where I say, uh, you know, uh, here I am a little angry that she's not telling me her secrets, and yet there are things that I don't tell her. Down there, it's a strange dance what we tell each other and what we don't. Can you get up a little? Or do you want to stay on the road? But knowing that the film was coming out, I knew I had to come out to her. And I went to see her, and she was I'm her only grandson, and she loves me. And I said, now, Mima, there's something I got to tell you. The man that I have been visiting you with for the last five years is my boyfriend, and I'm gay. And she cracked this big smile and said, you know, that Nick is so cute. He is adorable. You know, the gay issue for this film was a major one. There were many people who encouraged us to keep it out of the film. You're muddying the waters. Uh, you're complicating the issues. But Mackie felt that the experiences of being gay and coming out were crucial to his motivation in the film. So they made two cuts for test audiences. One where he talks about being gay, and one where he doesn't. 
by not including this aspect of my identity, the audiences were saying, we don't get him. We don't get his motivation on this search. What is it about him that you could tell us that would make that all make sense? And then when we showed them a cut where I talked about being gay and being an outsider in my family and knowing what it's like to keep secrets, they got it. Hi, I'm Wesley Snipes. Hi, I'm Catherine Linton. This is Petula Claw. No, wait a minute. I'm Kate Clinton. Pete Seeger. David Marshall Grant. Quentin Chris. Jason Alexander. We're Betty. And you're watching. You're watching. You're watching. In the Life. In the Life. In the Life. Now, I think that's fabulous. Still to come on In the Life. The Audrey Lord Project, a new kind of community center. And finding a safe place in cyberspace, surfing the web in search of virtual freedom. But first. So far in this program, we've looked at some of the more socially acceptable ways in which gay men and lesbians have escaped the confinements of culture and identity. In our next segment, however, we'll look at a category that remains the most rigidly defined, gender. It is, in fact, our very first label when a doctor announces it's a boy or it's a girl. In the new critically acclaimed film, Ma Vie en Rose, a little boy dares to cross the boundaries of gender by dreaming of becoming a little girl. But the fact that little boys can't marry other boys is not a problem to Ludwig, because he sees himself as, or at least one day becoming, a little girl. Now, if Ludwig were a real person and came to the attention of psychiatrists in North America, he could be diagnosed with a pathology called Gender Identity Disorder, or GID. GID first appeared in psychiatric manuals in 1980 and was directed towards treating children. Now the diagnosis encompasses both adults and children, but for this story, we focus on children and on some of the ways in which they are evaluated for GID. We begin in Toronto at the Clark Institute of Psychiatry. The Clark Institute of Psychiatry in Toronto, home to one of the largest gender identity clinics in North America. Since the late 1970s, I have been involved in the Child and Adolescent Gender Identity Clinic. I'm currently the head of that clinic. Dr. Kenneth Zucker is also author of Gender Identity Disorder and Psychosexual Problems in Children and Adolescents, a book that provides us with a roadmap into the diagnosis of GID. Cross-dressing is one of the earliest signs of possible GID. Uh, some parents will bring in photographs of their youngster toddling around in their mother's shoes, or they might grab a wig out of a dress-up box, or they'll put on their mother's jewelry. By age two, it's more common for them to get into dresses and other accoutrements. In addition to signs of cross-dressing, doctors have examined mannerisms and voice. Boys with GID exhibit stereotypical feminine body movements, such as letting their wrist go limp. Girls with GID display masculine traits, such as exaggerated walking, large strides. In addition, doctors have measured the level of physical attractiveness in children with GID. We have done some studies where photographs of the children have been rated blindly by university students. The first study of boys, they were rated for attractive, beautiful, cute, handsome, and pretty. In that study, the GID boys were rated as more attractive, beautiful, cute, handsome, and pretty than the control boys. When we used those same traits for girls with GID, they were rated as less attractive, beautiful, cute, and pretty. Those results made us wonder if attractiveness was connected to femininity for the judges. If a little girl insists on only wearing jeans and also insists that her hair be cut very short, it simply is reflecting her identification with maleness. Yet perhaps the most significant test for signs of GID is a child's toy and role play. Now he's choosing between Children being evaluated for signs of GID are placed in rooms with sex stereotype toys and clothing and observed through a one-way mirror. What is this about? What, what is this? 
Well, if you yeah. study the toy play of boys and girls or dress-up play, boys are typically interested in fantasy aggression, so they'll like to play with dart guns or they'll like to put on hats that signify masculine roles. Girls are m more interested in playing with a doll like Barbie or emulating some female by putting on high heel shoes. And the results from this task and many ones similar to it are that boys with GID play like typical girls play and girls with GID play like typical boys play. All of these studies made us question what children with GID grow up to become. There's no question that there is a developmental association between GID in childhood and later sexual orientation. The empirical evidence linking childhood gender identity disorder and adult homosexuality is clear and consistent. After 30 years of research, there are no studies showing that treating a child for GID has any effect on their adult gender identity or sexual orientation. Therefore, we looked at the clinical reasons given for treatment, as well as some of the criticisms these treatments have received from activists. Gender nonconformity is almost always viewed as a pathology, as a mental health issue, and the focus of mental health professionals will be on fixing you. Reasons for treatment. Prevention of homosexuality in adulthood. A homosexual lifestyle and a basically unaccepting culture simply creates unnecessary social difficulties. Those who advocate GID are often people who are liberal on the question of homosexuality. They're mental health professionals. They advocate toleration, but embedded in the theoretical matrix of gender identity disorder is actually an effort to eradicate homosexuality. Elimination of peer ostracism. Cross-gender identified children, particularly boys, are frequently ostracized by their peers. Gay and lesbian kids for years were described as saying, well, the problem is they feel isolated and vulnerable. Well, of course they did. People hated homosexuals. And when people stop hating gender variants, those kids will no longer feel isolated and depressed. Isolation and depression are normal responses in an abnormal, crazy world. Prevention of transsexualism in adulthood. There is little controversy in this rationale, given the emotional distress experienced by gender dysphoric adults. The reason that they're now defending people like Zucker are now defending the use of GID as a way to prevent transsexuality in adults is because clearly over 25 years it has failed abysmally to change homosexuality in kids and it's no longer politically expedient to say we're trying to prevent homosexuality. I feel so strongly that the pain of being a transsexual person you know comes from n not having a social space uh, to be transsexual you know transsexualism is not a valued identity at this point in time in this culture, just as lesbian gay identity is not particularly valued, but certainly more so than it used to be. But I love being a transsexual person. I think, you know, it's a somewhat difficult but interesting path. The fundamental problem with GID is it's a treatment in search of a problem. There is no problem with children being gender variant. Gender variance is good. Mais dis-moi, tu veux pas être comme tes frères, hein, ou comme ton père? You can't change the way someone feels. You can just make them feel rotten about themselves. In our next segment, special guest correspondent and author of the recently released my Gender Workbook, Kate Bornstein, takes us to a place where gender, race, culture, and other forms of identity can be transcended. Cyberspace. A recent Business Week survey found that nearly one-third of Internet users identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Imagine, one-third is us. <laughs> 
from local business to global activism, from youth services to AIDS resource networks, the internet has something for everyone. All you have to do is log on. For everyone who gets into mm -hmm. cyberspace, you suddenly have a bodiless, voiceless communication. The timber of your voice, the shape of your body no longer predetermines interactions or assumptions people are going to lay on you. So you have to ask yourself, who am I? What name do I want to use in cyberspace? And who is that person? And, and if I'm listening to someone else, I have to really listen to them because I can't see them and make judgments about them. Wouldn't it be nice to have a place where being safely out was just a mouse click away? Many queer internet users have found just such a place. And one of the things that altogether.com tries to do is actually give you a resource to use while you're coming out. And the beauty of this site is you get all kinds of different answers from all kinds of different real people. So you might type in, how will I ever tell my husband that his daughter might be lesbian? And all of our volunteers from all walks of life, priests, grandparents, parents, gay people, will give you an answer to that very question. The internet is really unique and, and it's got some really important features for gay people. And one of those is that you can connect in total privacy. So before you come out, when, and that's the time when you really need to understand who are those gay people in that community. Jen was a teen when she came out and life became unbearable in her hometown. Through the internet, she was able to find the support she wasn't getting at home. If I didn't have access to the internet, I'm not sure I'd even be alive right now. Um, I was in such a place of fear when I was looking for information um, on being gay on the internet that um, had I not found anything, it would have been fairly devastating. It would have been like, I'm the only one here. No one else feels like this. You know, I don't know anyone. And, um, and I wasn't willing to go into a mental institution, so I think um, suicide would have been an alternative to going in there. I would advise um, queer youth who are coming out now that if they have internet access to go on the internet and look for um, queer resources for youth. There are many more sites out there now than there were when I was first coming out. The internet is very grassroots. It's very much about anybody can do anything. And you can connect with people in Italy, people in Russia, with people from different races and creeds and religions. And, and the value of that is simply that, that you know, by the time you understand, you understand that you might be talking to a person in Italy or a person who's not like you, you're already friends with them. The ability to cover the globe in mere seconds is one reason that activists, especially international activists, are relying more and more on the Internet to make the world a safer place. The goal of the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission is to safeguard human rights for gay and transgendered people and people with HIV and AIDS worldwide. There are some obvious reasons why having email access and having internet access in order to do activism is a good thing. When someone can get an email within a few hours or within a few seconds, instead of taking a week or two weeks for mail to reach them, then they can act on that human rights violation a lot more immediately. Information is power, and there are three issues that we need to consider uh, regarding access. Who has it, who doesn't, and who cannot have it. Who has it and who doesn't are obvious questions of access. And who cannot have it has to do with censorship. We know about censorship, internet censorship in this country. We should also be aware about internet censorship in other countries. There are countries where the censorship is centralized, such as, for example, China and Singapore. Uh, but there are other places where the censorship is a little bit less obvious. For example, the activist may only have access to the internet through their computers at work and they may be less willing to exchange explicit communications about sexual orientation or whatever from their work computer. Recognizing the value of the digital revolution to the queer community, one organization formed to provide 24-hour road service to gay nonprofit groups struggling to get on the information superhighway. Digital queers programs fall into three main areas. Um, through the use, through our volunteers and our members, we get access to hardware and software that we then give to nonprofit organizations to help expand them. We do training and our trainings are open to anybody in the community to help them learn how to use email and online communications as well as basic commu computer information. And then finally we provide a lot of one-to-one -one support via phone or face-to-face -face with volunteers again helping to help people solve their individual computer needs. 
A current issue of great concern is the Communications Decency Act, filtering software, and this issue of trying to protect people from what's on the Internet. Our concern is that too many people who are trying to filter will filter everything gay and lesbian, and therefore the great resource for young queer people, as well as any queer person, will be eliminated automatically because the words gay and lesbian happen to appear on the website. The Internet certainly has its advantages. It can give you more information, it can give it faster and to more people all at once. All that is great and we use the Internet, but we are also aware of its limitations that we were talking before, the limitations about access, about censorship, and about accuracy of information. If you know what the limitations are, then you can get the best out of the Internet. DQ promotes that there are many places you can gain access even if you don't have your own computer. Public libraries, cyber cafes, colleges and universities will often make online access available to even non-students or to part-time students. So, we really need to help our community see main means of access. You know, if Dorothy had only known about the Internet, she could have emailed Aunt DM to have dinner ready by the time she got home. <laughs> For In the Life, this is Kate Bornstein. See you online. In the world of virtual reality, a person can remain virtually anonymous, free of the signifiers of gender, race, sexuality, whatever. In our final segment, we travel from cyberspace to a space where visibility is precisely the point. A community center designed specifically for gay people of color, where their unique issues and concerns can be front and center. <laughs> And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So, it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. Audre Lorde, black lesbian, feminist, warrior, mother, poet. She died of cancer in 1992, but her legacy lives on. This 130-year-old Presbyterian church in Brooklyn's Fort Greene neighborhood is the home of an organization named in her honor. This is the resource room, and it's the third floor of the Audre Lorde project. The Audre Lorde Project is the first community center ever for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and Native American, sometimes called two-spirit, people of color. The Audre Lorde Project really came about because of the fact that different people of color communities felt like there weren't necessarily uh, their needs being met in other mainstream service providers around the city, whether it was lesbian and gay service providers or whether it was people of color institutions. Um, because of racism within lesbian and gay organizations as well as homophobia within people of color institutions. For many, this is the first place where all their identities come together. There's a complete uh, integration uh, of, of, of my queer self, my black self, my person of color self, my whatever the other realities are. So my immigrant self, and they're all put into one and it's not, an, uh, it's a fit. One catalyst for the Audre Lorde project was the opening of Miss Saigon on Broadway in 1992. Many gay people of color thought the show's depiction of Asian women was racist and were angry that some prominent gay organizations used the opening as a fundraiser. Don't go in! Don't go in! Gay people of color mobilized to create a permanent space and services of their own. The initial discussions for something called the Audre Lorde Project really started in late 94, and we actually didn't move into the space until the summer of 1996. As many as 700 people a month come through the doors, 
to meet, to organize, to advocate, and to support one another's work. There are actually over 30 uh, queer people of color groups in New York City, although oftentimes people don't recognize that or realize that there are that many. We also have various working groups on different uh, initiatives around community education and organizing. And that includes issue areas like police brutality, immigrant rights and education, um, also working on documenting our histories through oral history as well as photo and um, video documentary. The spirit of the center's namesake, Audre Lorde, is always the guide. As a black lesbian, she recognized that People really did need to cross differences, whether it was around age or race and ethnicity or whether it was around other issues um, such as gender. The need to build coalitions across differences. The center currently has three full-time staff members. Samantha Martinez coordinates all the groups that meet here. She also manages all the volunteers. We get often get calls from people just that are uh, want to know, you know, very basic things like, uh, you know, I'm a young person, I'm a young person of color looking for a support group. Do you know of any? This past November, the Audrey Lord Project celebrated its one-year anniversary, a community celebration marking a milestone, a dream that came true to honor the vision of Audrey Lord. From all of us at In The Life, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by William J. Resnick, Jeffrey B. Soroff, the Michael Palm Foundation, the New York Community Trust, and In the Life members nationwide.